So greetings, and welcome to today's educational program, Quality, People Before Process, by Jeff Griffiths. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with ASQ's Quality Management Division. So today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Jeff Griffiths. Please join me in welcoming him. You see, Jeff is a leading practitioner in the optimization of the interface between individual competency and organizational design. He's a principal with Workforce Strategies International, a Canadian-based workforce and organizational development consultancy that helps clients achieve extraordinary results by focusing on the competencies, both overt and hidden, within their business. And so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Griffiths. Jeff, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Doug, and uh, and thanks to uh, the Quality Management Division for having me uh, speak to the, you guys today, uh, and welcome to all the folks who've uh, who've made it in. So Doug mentioned I, I'm a I'm a management consultant. Um, that's my my sin. Um, I've been a management organizational development consultant for a long time, over 20 years now. Um, and there may be other consultants in the group um, or people who are aspiring to be consultants. So I just wanted to start by sharing uh, the secret to successful consulting, um, which uh, is on the screen right now. Now, I'm, I've been working on the gray hair part of this for the last 20 years. I'm getting there. Um, I'm not going to talk about the other piece of it. This was actually a, a, a card that was given to me. Uh, the day I received my certified management consultant designation, uh, just about 20 years ago to the day. Um, so what I want to talk about today uh, is this notion that quality occurs at the intersection between people and processes. And both of these are important. But I am a firm believer that uh, the most important element of the two is the people side of it. And I'm a competency geek, unabashedly, unashamedly a competency geek. Um, but I wasn't always one, and I didn't always believe uh, in this. Um, my background is military. Uh, I was trained to be a technocrat uh, and believe in process. Uh, the things I was taught through my university programs uh, through management training that I did, you know, things like total quality management. Uh, I went through Kepner Trigo's rational manager program. Uh, later on, things like Six Sigma, process reengineering, all that other good stuff, all emphasized the process side uh, of generating performance and quality. What changed it for me was a particular experience that I had uh, during a deployment when I was in the Air Force. Um, and what happened was in the early 1990s, uh, I was the operations officer uh, and the second in command of a tiny, by Amer in American terms, uh, Canadian mobile radar squadron. Uh, the picture on the screen is actually, I, I found this, this is actually my old squadron. They were deployed into to Iceland uh, a year or so ago. And uh, this is the same equipment. We haven't changed it. It was uh, brand new when I was working on it. It is no longer brand new. Um, anyway, we were assigned uh, under the NORAD agreements, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, to conduct a covert counter-narcotics mission along the southern U.S. border how a bunch of Canadians from Bagotville, Quebec, wound up along the southern U.S. border is a whole different story. We can talk about that offline if you like. But we were tasked to do this, and so we put everything we owned, quite literally, uh, all of our equipment, all of our tools, spares, everything else, on one U.S. Uh, transport plane that came to get us, and 12 people, loaded us up uh, middle of the night, dropped us off in the middle of nowhere, and uh, we unloaded, set up, and went about our business for the next two months. And uh, so we had 12 people. Uh, never actually had more than three people, once we got things running, uh, set up, never had more than three people actually on the site at any given time. And because uh, we were operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And we actually did really, really well, surprisingly. Um, we even got managed to get a unit commendation from the commander in chief of NORAD out of this, which was surprising to us. Uh, we were eventually redeployed back to Canada, and the unit that was brought in to replace us brought 75 people to do the same job that we'd been doing with 12. And I was gobsmacked. Um, I spent a lot of time afterwards trying to figure out why and how we were able to do so much, so well, for so long, with so little. And I came to the conclusion that despite everything I'd been trained in, despite my bias towards technology process and systems, all the things I'd been taught, it wasn't our processes or our systems that made us successful down there. In fact, in many cases, we, we, uh, we were successful in spite of our processes and our systems. What made it all tick for us was the approach that we took to managing and handling the people side of the business. Some of that was conscious. Uh, most of it was entirely by accident, and, uh, and we kind of stumbled over it. But we learned that uh, a, a way to organize and lead the people that we had, the limited resources that we had, in order to achieve a lot of success. And that's been the focus of my work ever since the rest of my time in the Air Force, and then since I left the Air Force in the business and the private sector. And what I want to do today is talk about this, discuss a little bit about what we did and how we did it, um, but also look at some of the lessons learned and science behind this um, and why this is the approach that works and, uh, and why the people side of the business has to take primacy over the, uh, over the processes. And you can take what, we, what we're going to talk about and apply it in your own organizations and create teams that are able to execute beyond the limitations of their process. And I want to clarify, right? Um, I'm not saying that processes aren't important uh, or that you can get by without them, because clearly you can't, and clearly they are important. What I'm saying is that if in, in the scheme of things, it's the people side of the business that's more important. So I started off by saying that quality occurs at the intersection of people and process. And I truly believe this. Uh, this uh, it, it's not a, a foreign concept. Uh, but I want to unpack this a little bit. When we talk about people, what I'm really talking about here is competency, the abilities that people have, what they can do. Process is, for me, is this uh, blend of systems and technology, the what and the how we get things done, the, the, the you know, the how we want things to, to be done. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the kind of the definitions that we'll be using as we go through this. And I want to talk about a uh, something that struck me. Now, the... the we talk about the people side of business. Just about exactly 20 years ago, um, in 2001, Jim Collins wrote a bestseller called Good to Great uh, about how companies were doing things that stood them apart from their competition. And while some of the stuff in Good to Great hasn't aged particularly well, but there was one thing in there that uh, really struck me, and, and it stayed with me to, the, to, to this day. And this was Jim's notion of getting the right people on the bus. And the corollary to that, of course, is getting the wrong people off the bus. Or as he put it, first who, then what? And his point of view around this is that, you know, in a VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, it's the creativity and drive and innovation of the people that lead to success. In the face of change, it's people who can figure things out beyond process and get outside of process and work in spite of process who will determine whether or not an organization is successful. And organizations, as I've come to understand them, 
is their social technical constructs. And the, and the order of those words is pretty important. It's social technical, not technical, social. Throughout human history, you know, we as humans, we've banded together around, around solving problems as, uh, as teams, collectively, to do things collectively that we can't do by ourselves, whether it's, you know, uh, surrounding that woolly mammoth that uh, is going to be dinner, uh, protecting the, uh, the kids from the saber-toothed tiger or planting the crops. We've always organized ourselves. It's a fundamental characteristic of humans to organize ourselves around problems and find ways to solve them. That was true 20,000 years ago, and it's still true today. And the guru in my industry, uh, you know, he sort of, if, you, if you're familiar with Peter Drucker, whose picture's on the screen now. Um, Peter Drucker is to a management consultant. He's like Yoda to a Jedi, okay? Uh, he was like the uber consultant. He invented the, the, the game. Peter Drucker was talking in the late 1950s about the notion of the knowledge worker and the need to shift the way we manage organizations away from Taylorism, you know, and scientific management and very process-driven approaches to running a business towards an appreciation of the knowledge worker. So this is in 1959. A different paradigm to deliver value that recognizes the unique aspects of the knowledge worker. Okay. And the, day, the reality is today, you know, here we are, you know, 60 plus years later, and you can point at almost anybody in any job in any industry and say, hey, that's a knowledge worker. Because they work predominantly with their heads as opposed to with their hands. And there's been all kinds of other work that's been done on this as well. So you look at the work uh, Frederick Leloup, Reinventing Organizations, uh, you know, looked at a different paradigm around a human-centered organization and how that would drive better performance. Uh, Niels Fleising uh, wrote Organizing for Complexity, again, a different paradigm for understanding in complex changing scenarios how the top-down, structured, rigid organization was no longer capable of adapting and working effectively in that world. Uh, so the human-centered organization drives better results, and it's a necessary evolution in organizational practice. It's rooted in science, socio-technical systems theory, and complexity theory, and it's in the DNA of humans to operate in this way. And you don't have to just take my word for it or even these people's word for it. What I'd like to do now is uh, a little bit of a thought experiment. Okay? Um, and I think we can do that really quickly to get to the underlying logic of this. So, uh, and also because I wouldn't be a decent consultant if I didn't have at least one two by two matrix somewhere in my presentation. Well, the consultants union would be all over me. So that's what we're going to do, a little bit of a thought experiment. If we look at the, uh, you know, the famous consultants two by two matrix, let's assume, think in your heads, we're running a stable operation where, uh, with people involved in it. This is not a totally robotic automated process. Um, and if you look at the people and their capabilities, competencies along the X axis, uh, and the robustness and excellence of our processes up the y-axis, ask yourself where in these four quadrants do high-performing organizations reside? Let's think about that for a second. And, of course, it's up here, right, up in the top right quadrant. This is good people, you know, high-performing, good people executing good processes. And it's, uh, we'll call that quadrant high performance. Okay? This is the ideal. This is where everybody strives to be. So, of course, the opposite of that 
is down here. Oops. Right? This is ineffective people and lousy processes. Now, you can call this quadrant whatever you want. We call the top quadrant, top right quadrant, uh, high performance. Um, you can call this quadrant whatever you like. I call it doomed because I think that's what it is. These are people that are not going to be eating woolly mammoth tonight for supper. Um, and so now comes the choice. Okay, think about this some more. If you have the choice of either the top left quadrant, process excellence, or the bottom right quadrant, which is people excellence, which one do you choose? And uh, if you want, just type in the chat, you know, if you think it's the top left quadrant, type in a left or an L. If you'd like to prefer the bottom right quadrant, type of an R or right. And we'll give you a sec there to do that. Um, I mean, it should be fairly obvious, right? So really right, right, okay, we're seeing some, some answers. Um, and yes, of course, right, it's obvious. Given the choice, you pick the lower right. Why? And, you know, great people but lousy processes, because even though the initial results might be horrible because you don't have good process, the good people will invent new processes and move you as rapidly as possible up to that top right quadrant. Okay. And if you're the other way around with good processes and lousy people, those improvements won't happen. Uh, and your short-term results are likely uh, not particularly good either. This becomes even more apparent if we have a disruption. So we're moving along, we're nice and, and, and comfortable, things are, are, are going great, we're stable, and we're up here in the top right quadrant and all of a sudden there's a disruption which means our current processes don't work anymore they're no longer applicable they're no longer valid we are forced down in, now into that bottom right quadrant but the good people will figure it out and rapidly find a way to move us in the right direction again and in the world we're in now where things are changing so fast whether it's in business in life or anything else it's the quality of the people individually and collectively that will drive success, okay? So it's pretty obvious, and this is what I was learning, and in fact, really relearning, because when you think about it this way, it's actually pretty organic. Um, you can't imagine thinking in a different way. Uh, but this is what I was learning in the field when uh, on, that, uh, on the mission I mentioned. It's what we've seen is, as consultants you know, countless times since in organizations of all different sizes, in organizations working in all kinds of different uh, industries and different, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, different types of businesses, okay? The secret sauce for success is summed up by the, the people equation, the people side of the business. And we like to look at this this way. This uh, three circles diagram is actually uh, the basis for an industrial leadership program that uh, we run for frontline leaders and managers uh, in a whole bunch of different environments, mostly manufacturing and processing. Uh, but we've, we've applied it in, in, a, in a number of different places. And it basically says that if you're a leader and you're not sure of your job description, right, if, and, and you're, you have a, a hazy, fuzzy job description, this is actually a pretty good job description for a frontline leader or, any, in fact, any leader, right? Achieve the task, build and maintain the team, and develop the individual. Uh, the top circle is process. It's what. It's how. Okay. And it's important. That's what the customers are paying for. But the bottom two circles are the foundation. And what we found is this whole idea of building, maintaining the team, as Collins said, you know, putting the right people on the bus uh, and developing them as individuals and collectively as a team. 
uh, to the maximum of their potential. That's the secret sauce. And the more time you spend on the bottom two circles, the less time you have to worry about the top because the top becomes self-evident and self-fulfilling. Okay. Achieving the task becomes a foregone conclusion. And a focus by frontline leadership and managers on this notion of developing the people at the bottom of the pile, the frontline people, your direct reports, has an impact in every single metric, not just quality. Okay. So a competency-based talent-first approach drives uh, positive movement on whatever metrics you're using. We, no matter what industry we look at, most key performance indicators break down and can group them into one of four categories. It's either safety, quality, productivity, or cost. Those are the things that you manage every single day in order to make, make your numbers. Okay. Uh, and by focusing on the people side, you impact every one of these. And the question then becomes, well, how? And how am I going to do this? You know, what is the, the magic formula? What's the recipe? And there's only, uh, it's a, it's a five-step process. Okay. So the first step is to figure out what the requirement, uh, what the competencies that you need are by analyzing the work that needs to be performed and measuring where you are as a collective individually and, and as, as teams against this ideal uh, map of, of competency. And uh, when we, we build these constructs, uh, we work with, with, with organizations, we use a, a basically a formula when we, when we look at this. And so it's use what, what underlying knowledge, what underlying skills, in what context, where, the, uh, the industrial environment, the business environment, to do what and to achieve what kind of results. And when you build a competency statement that way, it becomes very easy to measure against, both for yourself and for the people on the team. It can self-measure against it. And you build these out for a, uh, uh, at, a, at a team level around the work that needs to be performed at the front line in collaboration with the people that are doing the work. And you'll find that there are, uh, you know, somewhere between eight and 20, usually, and the sweet spot seems to be around a dozen, 15, of these competency statements that will allow you to actively manage the day-to-day -day performance of, uh, of people and for them to measure their performance and measure their growth every single day on every single job. Okay. And so you measure where they are, then you measure where your people are relative to them and decide where the gaps are and look at ways of filling those gaps. The second piece of this, and this is something that came out of uh, my experience in the military, is that nobody is their job description. Nobody is just their qualifications and certifications and degrees or anything else. People are the sum total of everything they've ever done. And they bring all that to work with them every day. So uh, the secret to unlocking that hidden, what I call latent potential in an organization is understanding whole person competency. And you do this by talking to people, by, uh, you know, surveying people, by getting people to write things down uh, themselves and engaging with them. It's a really a, a, a function of frontline leadership, the people closest to the, uh, the people doing the work. You know, and this is one of the reasons I mentioned when uh, our, my opening example with the little radar squadron that could. One of the reasons that we were able to do so much was because we embraced this notion, partly out of necessity, because uh, we only had 12 people, but partly uh, consciously, later on as we were starting to figure this out, we started actually consciously doing it. Um, but we allowed people the opportunity, encouraged people to use all of their skills. And so we wound up with uh, operating, you know, operators, operations people who could do basic uh, systems maintenance on, on the equipment. We uh, had uh, radar technicians, radar specialists, who could do, who 
had learned how to run the radio or fix the radios in the satellite system, and they could uh, work uh, in operations as well. We had everybody able to, you know, fix trucks because we, you know, we had people who did that for a hobby, um, and and so we wound up putting people in positions where they could work within their entire skill set outside of their job descriptions in order to get more out of them. That created engagement, and uh, it was uh, it was a, a phenomenal uh, uh, deployment, right? And the other piece of this is, and you could actually call this 2A and 2B as opposed to 2 and 3, but it's the other side of this, is not only what can they do, what do they like to do? What do they want to do? Where do they want to be? What do they want to, where do they want to go? What do they want to be when they grow up? And understanding that as a frontline leader allows you to shape the work in ways that motivate the individual because you're taking them where they want to be. And then once you've done all of this is to optimize your team composition and the job assignments and everything else uh, with a mix of different proficiencies within, the, within those teams to get the best fit. Not only the competencies needed to do the work, but the competencies that people need to develop. Uh, so you, you mix your team, a mix of different proficiencies within the team. And uh, you do this through job assignments and, and, and other things. And then you have a conscious effort by everybody in the organization to develop people. In the military, one of, in reality, this is one of the only things the military is actually really good at, is developing people. And there's, you know, uh, self-serving need reasons for it in the military. We need people who are able to step up when things go sideways and all of a sudden uh, there's casualties and whatever and people need to move into different positions. They need to be able to grow. And so you're continuously, constantly developing talent, developing people, developing capability. You're doing that through job assignments, through the delegations that you're doing with uh, individuals. You're doing that through mentoring, coaching, uh, either directly yourself or within the team, constant appraisal of where people are at, again, by you as the leader, but also by the individual self-appraising where they're at and reflection on where they're at, where they're going, and what they need to do to get there. So it's a very iterative and, uh, and, and really organic process once you get used to doing it. So, and then it's, you know, it, it turn the turn the wheel on the sausage machine again. It's monitor, adjust, and repeat. You know, rinse and repeat, recycle, and keep keep checking. Um, you know, and it's plan, do, check, act, right? And so these are, you know, five deceptively simple steps. Uh, you know, but you know, the, the reality is it takes work. This is not something you shut down on Friday and then on Monday morning everything's you know all sunshine and apple pie, it takes commitment, it takes work, and it's, a, it's, it's actually hard work to get there, but it's worth it because of the results that you'll generate from doing it. Um, and I'd like to uh, home in right now on this one aspect about developing people. I mentioned about taking the, uh, you know, a mix of different proficiencies when you're forming teams and when you're assigning work and everything else. And so what I want to do, and I apologize for the slide, uh, this is the only way I could fit this on here. Uh, but this is, if if you're not familiar with it, this is a Dreyfus and Dreyfus proficiency scale, what we refer to as a Dreyfus scale. And it lays out proficiency levels uh, from the novice, total, uh, totally inept, no real ability, no real knowledge, certainly no context, all the way through to the expert. And it identifies how they handle knowledge, how they deal with change and, uh, you know, differences in the way they have to apply things. And so the Dreyfus scale actually came out of a, a study um, by the United States Air Force back in the early 80s to start quantifying this so you could start understanding how to, how to train people, how to grow people. Um, and the thing is that you need to understand, if you're looking at this, 
Um, the further up that scale you go towards expert, the less management and supervision you require. In fact, the further up the scale you go, if you try and impose management, supervision, and process structure on them, it, it makes people angry and they tune out. Okay. At the lowest end, they need all the structure in the world. A novice does exactly what they're told because they don't have enough capability or, uh, and knowledge to to do anything else. So they're, they're at that point, they're a human robot. They do exactly what they're programmed to do. If you're doing things right, you're building people up to a competent level and, and beyond, okay? And you're using the people who have competency to grow competency in other people. But I caution you against using the experts. And, and the reason for that, if you've ever, anybody's ever experienced instruction from a true expert, they're unconsciously competent in as much as they don't even, in many cases, remember why they're doing the things they're doing uh, and why they're doing it the way they're doing it. They just know that that's the way it needs to be done. It's very hard for a true expert to relate to the novice. And, uh, you know, anybody who's ever had a university professor may have experienced this. I know I did in calculus class a long, long time ago. Um, the best teachers come from the, uh, you know, people who are competent but still have to think about what they're doing. And in the one example of that that I remember from my days in the military, the most of the, uh, or not most, but a, a large percentage of the uh, flying instructors in initial flying training were people who had just graduated with their wings. And the reason for that is they were still thinking about what they were doing. And by teaching it to other people, they actually got better at it, but they were also consciously competent and they knew what they had to do in order to teach it to somebody else. And that's something to consider when you're looking at this. So um, a bit of a sidebar, okay, I may or may not be familiar with the uh, Gallup organization. They do political polling and all that other stuff, but they also do a lot of other uh, polling and, and uh, statistical research. So the Gallup organization does an annual survey, the Q12 survey, on employee engagement. Um, and the results of that are actually pretty disheartening because what it tells us is that, you know, anywhere between two thirds and three quarters of the people working in North American businesses are either disengaged or actively disengaged. Actively disengaged meaning they're actually sabotaging the people who are putting food on their table. You know, so they're not really there at work. They've checked out. And one of the uh, annual reports from uh, from Gallup, they took it a little further, and they started correlating engagement with age and education. And interestingly enough, the lowest level in engagement came from young people with lots of education. This is not to slag the young people. There's a reason why this exists. And you can find it by looking at the scale. We hire people because they're really, really competent. We hire people because they came from the best schools, because they have the best degrees, because they got the best marks. And then we put them in an organization that treats them as an advanced beginner, locks them into a, a process-driven cycle where they're going to stay for a few years, and they rapidly tune out because they've got brains the size of small planets and they'll want to let them use them. That's a organizational defect, right? There's only four reasons why someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do or why they're not performing where they should be, right? They either don't know how to do it, we can fix that. They don't know they're supposed to do it, we can fix that. They know what they're doing and they don't know, you know, and they, uh, and, and they know they're supposed to do it. And they know how to do it, but something in the organization or the way the work is structured prevents them from doing it. That's a management problem. We can fix that. Or they don't feel like it. And again, that's a management problem. We can fix that. So the idea of how you fit people in based on competency is really important. How you assign work, how you organize work, how you organize teams around competency is absolutely critical. And it, there's huge psychological uh, implications in terms of motivation and engagement. So back to our buddy, uh, you know, Mr. Drucker, okay? Another Drucker quote, 
you know, recognizing that smart people, capable people, who are put in a world where they're not allowed to use their heads, they're not challenged, they either quit the great resignation or they rapidly regress to mediocrity. And that's not good. Okay. Interesting from that Q12 survey, the highest levels of engagement came from people who had possibly less training, less education, but had to stretch and grow every single day. And that's important because it drives to the next, uh, the next point. Okay. Why is it that this focus on developing competency, on driving people to the edge of where they're comfortable, what is it that, how does that focus on competency create people who are adaptable and flexible and resilient and change ready? And what are the implications of that for your business? Okay. Now, there's a mechanism that drives this. And th there's, you know, it's not a lot of woohoo. There's science behind it. And we call this the zone of proximal development. This is an, actually an education uh, construct uh, by a fellow named uh, Lev Vygotsky. Uh, but it has real applicability in terms of organizational structure and organizational design. Basically what it says is that people learn best and progress fastest when they're just outside of their comfort zone. There's the middle of it, the things they can do by themselves that they don't need any help with. There's the next band on this. They can do it, but not on their own. They need guidance. They need help. They need support. And then there's the stuff that they can't do. That's where they fail. That's where they get frustrated. And so the whole idea in learning and teaching and scaffolding learning is to keep people in that zone of proximal development where they're having to stretch, but there's support available to help them. Now, what happens when you put your entire organization in the zone of proximal development? What you wind up with is an organization where everybody from the top to the bottom is a little bit uncomfortable. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. We uh, studied one organization down in the States who effectively had a policy that said, if you're 10 out of 10 on your performance appraisal, you're in the wrong job. And if you're happy being 10 on 10 in your performance appraisal, you're in the wrong company. Because they had a, a culture that said, everybody's here to learn. We're going to, from the CEO down to the janitor who was cleaning out the waste baskets, we're all going to be on the edge. We're all going to be a little bit uncomfortable. And we're going to be uncomfortable uncom being uncomfortable. So what happens, right, when you organize that way, when you focus on constant development of talent in the, in the business? You get an organization that becomes a living, breathing, learning organism. It's not static. It's ready to work in ambiguity and uncertainty. It will learn its way to success. And that's extremely powerful, particularly in a world where nothing is static anymore. Okay. What you get is what I was so fortunate to stumble across with 12 Radar. Um, you know, a unit that could punch above its weight, deliver impossible performance, no matter what it was we threw at them. And it was a really fun place to work. You know, and so what I want to do is give you a couple more concrete examples of this in action and the results that it's generated for organizations. So the first one is a client of ours. It's a steel fabrication and construction company. They had an award-winning safety program, um, but they only had industry average safety numbers. So their TRIF numbers, uh, total recorded injury frequencies, were actually pretty average, pretty mediocre 
uh, in terms of where they were. They were still putting people in the hospital, even though they had an award-winning safety program. And then they had a near fatal accident. And fortunately, the, uh, it was only near fatal. Someone should have got killed, but they didn't. But the senior managers, the COO and the VP of uh, production, were there on the site when it happened. They saw it happen. And that's a life-changing uh, event for the fellow who got hit in the face with 10 tons of steel, but also for the people who had to watch it happen and see the, uh, you know, the aftermath of it. And they said, that's it. This is never going to happen again on our watch. And what they did is they threw out their safety program, their award-winning safety program. They threw it out, and they started focusing, laser focused on the individual competency at the shop floor and on the construction sites. It started with the, the, with the hands-on trades because that was the biggest safety issue. It actually eventually permeated through the entire organization, top to bottom, this competency-based approach. Now, it's not an overnight process. This took a long time. It's hard work. But over a couple of years, they had a 3,700% improvement in their safety record. And so their TRIF, the numbers that were averaged before, they were up to 5 million person days without a lost time accident. And, you know, which is, like I said, that was a 3,700% improvement over their worst years. Okay. So in addition to the saving on the human cost of an accident, which by itself would have been enough to do this, they had no more accidents. So their safety record went up, which means their costs went down because they weren't spending money on uh, their workers' compensation. Uh, insurance premiums actually went down. They had the, the knock-on effect. I said the focus on competency actually affects all of your key performance uh, metrics. So while they focused on safety, what they found is that by doing things safe meant doing things right. Doing things right means their quality numbers went up and they had no more rework. And that things that were sent to the field for assembly went together properly. So their productivity went up and their quality numbers went up. And their costs went down. Um, they didn't have to shut down sites to do accident investigations anymore and clean up the mess. Uh, so obviously their safety numbers went up, but their productivity and, uh, and cost numbers improved as well for the same reasons. We're talking ag on aggregate millions of uh, direct and indirect, you know, and uh, value that comes out of this. And that means they can put in more competitive bids because their costs are lower. They win more jobs. They generate more revenue. They make more profit. They can have more people working. It's just a win-win all around. This is a really, uh, a real success story. And it's all because of this focus on competency. The last example I'm going to give is in another company, not one of our clients, but it's a company we study pretty extensively. This is a refinery up here in Canada. Uh, they uh, heavy oil. And refineries are full of pipes and flanges and whatever all else. When you do maintenance on a refinery, you shut whole chunks of it down and you tear it apart and you rebuild it and you put it back together. The most dangerous, critical part of a maintenance shutdown is startup. And the, uh, you know, if things leak, leaks cause fires, leaks cause explosions, leaks get people hurt, leaks cause environmental damage, um, productivity issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Leaks are a bad thing. And they were getting leaks all the time following maintenance shutdowns. And that's not unusual. So what they did is they put in place something they called a bolted joint integrity management program. That's a really fancy way of saying, let's make sure people bolt the flanges up properly. And started focusing, and these are people, like the, 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 the trades that were working on this, these are, you know, uh, journeymen, pipe fitters, and millwrights, and whatever. These are not people who are, you know, don't know how to do it. But this is a high leverage area. They did their homework. They looked into it, and they said, "Let's let's let's focus on this area and see what happens." The result of this was a half day of focused training to 
make sure that everybody was performing at a level of competence in terms of bolting up flanges. That sounds really simple, because it is. Okay. That half day of training to a demonstrated competency standard resulted in no more accidents with people getting uh, leaks uh, and you know hot bitumen spilled on their head after a startup. That's good. So that impacts safety, it impacts cost. Last time I checked, 85,000 flanges and counting without a leak following maintenance shutdown. That's quality, that's a cost issue. Um, because they don't leak, they have startups finish and, uh, on time and the, thing, and the plant goes back into production on time. No rework. That's, that impacts productivity and it impacts costs. They've actually managed to uh, look after twice the refining capacity. They bought another refinery. And they're now managing the maintenance on twice the production capacity with the same size maintenance crew because they're not having to redo things. So again, productivity and cost advantage. This is adding literally millions and millions of dollars to the bottom line of this company on an annual basis, right? And it's free money. All they have to do is focus on making sure that people are growing and continuously growing their competencies. These are real numbers. These are big numbers. The ROI for doing this and focusing on the people side of the business is absolutely huge. And that's about it. Right. If I leave you with nothing else today, I mean, this is my sermon, right? But it's people over process. As a leader in an organization, your primary role is to develop people. You need to start small and iterate. Don't try and, you know, run a whole a huge organization through this process all at once. But you can do this at a team level. And that's where the biggest impact comes anyway, because that's where the uh, that's where the work happens. That's where the value, the real value gets added for, for an organization. As a leader, you assign jobs and work so that you're consciously developing competency in the people that are, that are with you. You're working on developing that daily, and it's not an event. It's a journey. So it's a constant daily monitor, adjust, repeat, monitor, adjust, repeat. What happens, okay? Again, I go back to my three circles. Okay. A focus on the people side of the business, the foundation of these three circles drives higher performance in every single one of your key metrics. It increases engagement and commitment. It creates a workplace that doesn't suck and where people want to come to work and want to perform uh, at a higher level. So you focus on the people, focus on continuously improving the human capital, and you will create an organization that can deliver more value for your customers faster and for less. And that's it. And on that happy note, uh, I'll be glad to take your questions. All right, Jeff. Boy, do we have a bunch of questions. <laughs> It's been busy here. Okay. Uh, so, um, looking at uh, looking at your <laughs> man, uh, and, and they keep pouring in. All right. So, uh, one individual just mentioned uh, that going through this process, working on competencies will take longer, but the result will give us more consistent and a longer life. Uh, I can't dispute that. Um, you know, there's. Uh, let's see here. I'm I'm actually going to take one of the one of the later ones here, okay? okay. Because sure. it's just uh, it just came in. I think it's marvelous. How do you get people to be comfortable in that proximal space? You said they're uncomfortable, but how do how do you get them to accept that discomfort? <laughs> um, and I I I'm not going to make any. Uh, 
bones about the fact that it's it's it, it you don't snap your fingers you it's it you can't you know wiggle your nose like bewitched and all of a sudden everybody's happy being uncomfortable it's a it's an iterative process it starts small so you don't take people uh and and try and do this all at once we experiment with it it's in in many ways no different than uh if you're teaching uh teaching children or teaching a dog Right, you put them outside of their comfort zone, but don't let them fail, and they gain confidence. And you find that actually people gain confidence pretty quickly. It's hard the first time, but if you put the right supports in place so that they do it and don't fail doing it, that generates confidence and it breeds a climate where people are more inclined to experiment and, and see how far they can push the boundary. So as I said, it's no different in many ways than um, other, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, other ways that you would teach and train, right? It's not about throwing people off the deep end and sink or swim. The other thing, and I think it's, it's, it's important, is when we're working in this way, and we're working and trying to keep people in that zone of proximal development, we're working on trying to get people comfortable being uncomfortable, is that we have to run a no consequences mm -hmm. thing. If I give you a job to do, and, I, and it's outside of your comfort zone, and you fail at it, the consequences are on me, not on you. Okay? So the, um, and that, I mean, that's another incentive for the leadership to make sure that failure doesn't occur. That doesn't mean that you do the work for them. That means that you make sure that all of the supports and structures is around the job so that people aren't allowed or aren't given the opportunity to to have, you know, catastrophic failure. And I don't know if that answers the question or not, but I think that's the key. It's, it, it, okay. There's a balancing act associated with that. All right. Thank you. Yes. We've had a couple of questions regarding uh, uh, automation of work processes. You know, the artificial intelligence, machine learning is getting better and better, and uh, there's ways to automate office work and other kinds of work. So what what's your thought about... In this world we're transitioning to where there's a lot of automation taking place, mm -hmm. um, how, how, how do we maintain a focus on proficiency of the humans when the humans are being taken out of the picture? Well, that's a good question. It's a really relevant question. Um, my, my belief is that in the things that are going to make us successful uh, in the future as human beings are the things that make us human. And I'll, I'll try to unpack that a little bit, right? If, you're, if your plan for success is to be better, faster, stronger, uh, and smarter than the machines, well, you've already lost. Okay, so give up. The things that make us, help, make us valuable as humans are the things that make us human. Those are collaborative skills, creative skills, and other things. Most work, and, and this is historical, we always find ways to automate the, the drudgery out of work and put it put a machine in place to do work that's dangerous or, or crappy, um, and yet we find things for the, uh, the displaced people to do. There's a challenge, and it's a societal challenge. It's not just a business challenge, but there's a societal challenge around that transition to a much more automated workplace in what do you do with all these people that are displaced. And so we need to look at retraining, reskilling, and everything else, and the critical skill sets, honestly, moving forward are creative thinking skills, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, collaborative skills, communication skills, even for people who are not traditionally in those kinds of roles because they're going to be managing machines and, man and working with machines, you know, alongside the machine. Um, I, I'm looking at a job right now in our business where we're looking at uh, future skills in the workforce of the future in mining, where the, you know, at the mineral face, at the rock face, it's, it's going to be completely automated and it's going to be robots drilling. The people that traditionally run that equipment are going to be managing that equipment. And what are the skill sets that it require, those digital skills and other skills? What are the skills they need around problem solving? And, and heading off the uh, the problems that come. And so I think there's, there's, a, there's uh, 
not, again, I'm not going to pretend that it's an easy, an easy future. But I think forward-looking companies are looking at ways of reskilling, upskilling, as well as looking at the future skills requirements and building talent pipelines internally and externally to make sure that that's uh, that, that we're addressing that. Because the societal impact of not addressing it is huge. Right? We don't need that many people sitting at home, uh, you know, uh, waiting for uh, for the next, uh, you know, unemployment check to come in. Thank hopefully, you. That, hopefully that answers the question. I think so. Okay, we've got a pair of questions here that are like on either side of the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, you have some people who really, really want to grow their proficiency, uh, and and uh, what what can those people do to improve their pace of learning? But you've got other people who don't want to improve their proficiency. How do you deal with them? And, and I, I I guess I go back to what I said earlier. Um, you. This is not a a, a one-day thing, right? This is an iterative process, and it takes time. The if you if you shift an organizational culture towards continuous learning, and there are people who uh, who reject that culture, it's the opposite or the other side of what Collins was talking about in Good to Great. About it's not only getting the right people on the bus, but it's getting the wrong people off the bus. Um, Two things will happen with the people who are not uh, ready, willing, and able to do this. They will self-select out and go work someplace else. That's that's an option. Um, or you, as a manager, have a duty to the organization to reassign them, either voluntarily or otherwise, to places where their skill sets are useful, um, or uh, help them to uh, choose other duties, we'll use that euphemism. And I mean that's the uh, that that's the sad reality. My guess is, and this is based on my experience with with uh, organizations, is that for every organization that makes a conscious effort to push in this direction, there's ten that won't, and uh, until they're forced to, because no one likes to change. And so an organization that moves in this direction and, and finds that they're leaving people behind, those people will wind up working for the organizations who are not making the changes rapidly. And so there's displacement, but it's useful displacement. It's needed displacement. At the same time as you're doing that, you're going to attract more of the kind of people that do want to grow. So it's a, a, a net gain for, for your organization. That's not to suggest that you know you you know mass fire people who don't jump on board right away, um, but it's uh, it, I think it, it's it's inevitable that you uh, there's a certain degree of turnover with any change in an organization, and this is this is uh, is, is part of that. And some turnover needs to be how we say management induced. <laughs> okay. Yeah, your, your turnover can be too slow, uh, too low, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. All, all turnover isn't bad turnover. Yeah. Right. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's better. And 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 I mean, it, it's often better for the individual as well as the organization mm -hmm. if you move them into some place where they are comfortable, whether it's in your own organization or in another organization. You're not doing them any favors by putting them in over their head or having them be miserable, and they're not doing your organization any any uh, any favors by having that dragging the organization down and dragging everybody else down with it. Let's face it. Um, and you know, so you you work on changing the attitude and changing and, and, and dealing with the problem that way. But if you can't, ultimately, the solution may be to move that person out. Okay. Yep. Sometimes that's it. All right. Um, so, all right then. We are at the top of the hour, and what I'd like to do here is to kind of do some uh, do some closure here. All right. Um, the uh, 
If there are more questions, please post or email them, and we will provide answers to the talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna we're gonna end the recording now.